Hello everyone, my name is Falling Hertz, and this is episode 4 of Fall Damage, a show where I talk to game developers of all big and small sizes in all roles in the game industry. Today I'm joined by Bobby from Mist of Dev, who is currently working on Chasmal Fear, a horror game that we'll get into more of the details of in just a few moments, but I want to take some time to actually talk specifically about you know, some of those specific instances of working with this game, having prior already released the game, and also a little bit of talking about the Steam Next Fest and how that is for his game. So with that being said, Bobby, thank you for joining me. I really appreciate that. Um, if you wanted to kind of intro yourself, maybe give a little bit of background that we may get into a little bit deeper, but give a little background of who you are and uh, your experience and what you're working on. Uh, hey there, Coleman. Thank you f uh, for asking me to be like on this podcast. And hello to everyone, uh, to your community. I'm so glad to be here. And I'll probably start like um, where I started uh, game dev. So I started like probably 10 years ago, something like that, around 10 years ago. Yeah. So that basically when Unreal Engine 4 released. Uh, previously, I had like a couple of weeks trying something out in Unity. However, uh, I found myself more in Unreal Engine, uh, and that's when I started game development. So I've been working like for 10 years. Uh, besides game development, back then, now I'm a full-time game dev, but back then I was uh, doing it as a hobby, and I was working as a digital marketeer. So uh, when I started working like four, uh, sorry, 10 years ago, um, most, most of the things I, was, uh, I did was working for clients, like a freelancer. So I was doing 3D modeling and stuff like that, and some mobile games. But I never had the courage to do a game on my own. Okay. Yeah, so like 10 years ago was uh, when I started. But around eight years or something like that, uh, I uh, began working on my first game, which most people don't know because, like, when when you check uh, check me on Steam, you will find out that under Mist of Death, it's right. only Mirror Forge and Chasmophere. However, back then it was it wasn't Mist of Death; it was Mist of Studios. I just so, when I was looking at your Discord a few minutes ago, I actually noticed that, and I was like, "Let's check out uh, Alan." Ellen Shop, yes. Okay, yeah. I was gonna say I did a little quick search. I was like, oh, what's this about? So I do kind of I did just realize that, but I wasn't prepared for that at all. So I won't have any questions yeah. about those per se. Yeah, no worries. So uh for Mystic Dev, a lot of people confuse me, they call me Mystic Dev. And there it's actually like you like you pronounced it, Mystic Dev. Yeah. Uh so Mystic is I was thinking, like, how, how do I come up with a unique name that's a little bit different and not too cringe? And going back to Alan Sharp, which was a game that was horror, but it was also a detective game. Okay. Uh, that's how we came up with the name uh, Mystive, which is Mysterious Detective. So it's a, like a coined word of two different words. So that's how it came to be, like, Mystive. Mm, so, cool. yeah. That's how we started with Alan Sharp. We worked a long time on Alan Sharp. However, I'm not going to dive too much into this. Like, there are a lot of things going on back then. We had creative differences with another developer. We separated. And that's how I found Mystic Dev. Gotcha. Gotcha. Okay. So now with Chasmal Fear and I assume Mirror Forge, that's with your brother? Is that correct? Uh, yeah. So for Mirror Forge, my brother was helping me more like a it was more like a freelance job. He wasn't working full time with me. Okay. He was helping me here and there because primarily I'm a 3D artist. I was doing level design, lighting and stuff like that. I wasn't that good in programming, although I know some of the basics. But when it comes to complex parts in programming, like I don't know, inventory and save systems and stuff like that, that's uh, when I needed the help. And when I reached out to him, he said like, sure, I'll do that for you. Nice. And we had a very good collaboration. That's how we started working. And for Chasmophir, now we, both of us are working full time on the game. Gotcha. So okay. it, it's kind of easier for me, yeah. <laughs> now, how is, um, and that was one of the questions I had lined up. How is working, like, is it just the two of you? Yeah, it's okay. only two yeah. of us. Okay, so how is working with your brother? Is that, is it weird ever? Like, if there's, if you said you've had pretty good cooperation, is there any, like, creative different? I mean, you don't need to tell me, like, hey, fuck, like, you're talking fuck you on the phone. But like, you guys have creative differences, or is it pretty pretty well flowing? I guess actually, 
pretty there's a pretty good flow in our work yeah. uh, because like we are very similar and we love uh, similar things yeah and also one thing we realized like previously like i mentioned i was working in marketing and uh i realized that when i quit my job and went to work and um, work full-time as a game developer i knew that i had to do a lot of research and stuff like that so basically most of the things that we do are based on data and what uh, the market likes what the players like so it's not like something that uh yeah, we love it, but it's not like 100% that we love everything. So sometimes we have to have to find a compromise, right. uh, like what the players want and what the audience wants. So uh, he understands that really good. And we are both huge gamers. Uh, I don't know if you've read, like, I think I wrote a tweet on Twitter a few days ago, but uh, I was on PC ever since I was born. So my <laughs> father was a programmer and I, the first games I played were like Warcraft and... Blackthorn from Blizzard and Doom and Duke Nukem. So yeah, those were the first games. And I was very late to the. Uh, I was very late to the trend. I mean, I was born in 1999, so I was late to a lot of it. But I think my first PC game was the original Doom, mm -hmm. and then I did end up playing mostly Warcraft three and Starcraft. But I did end up going back and playing a little bit of Warcraft one. So I mean, I, I kind of yeah. know the era a little bit of what you're speaking, but. For the most part, I, I missed that, so. Yeah. Oh, by the way, I wanted to ask you, how many years would you give me? How, like, how old do I think you are? Yeah, how old, yeah, how old Okay, do you listen. Think you oh, man. <laughs> oh, you're putting me on the sp Oh, man, I don't know. Okay, so. Okay. Do yeah, uh, a lot of people think I'm far younger than I look. Okay, so with that being said... I'm going to say you're 32. Oh, you're very close. 31. Okay. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> All right. The, I was I was originally going to say 31 and a half to be funny, but I was always going to go for 32. Okay. Well, that's not too bad then. All right. I would have said lower had you not said people say you're younger. So, okay. Fair yeah. enough. Okay. So, you know, I kind of covered the working with the brother thing. I, that interested me from the get-go when I first messaged you guys. I was like, I wonder how that works or how that is. But, um, you know, before we get too far into it, I did want to kind of cover Chasmal Fear. I would hate to get all the way through, like, an hour-long thing and, like, not talk about the game when people may, you know, retention in the beginning. So if you yeah. want to give kind of, like, the uh, elevator pitch for Chasmal Fear, and I'll mm -hmm. talk a little bit about what I – because I've played the demo twice now – and, you know, during the Steam Next Fest, I believe, is when it first launched. And then I just played it yeah. earlier today to kind of refresh my memory. But if you mm -hmm. want to give the elevator pitch, and I'd like to talk a, bit, a little bit about that specifically, then we can move on to some of my other questions. Yeah, sure thing. So, uh, Casmo Fear is basically... I just started, like, before the elevator pitch so people can understand. Like, okay. uh, as you know, like, there were a lot of uh, games coming out with this new trend, the body cam game. And yes. one thing we've noticed is that a lot of people loved it. Yeah. Uh, but most of the games that we've seen in the body cam genre were, like, uh, either core walking simulators or realistic shooters. Yeah, and, Mil like military uh, sim type or, like, yeah, I yeah. know what you mean. Yeah, so uh, while sitting with my brother, we were discussing this, and I had an idea, like, uh, what would it be to play a body cam game, like, seeing it from a perspective of a camera, but, but it's set in the future, and it's a sci-fi. Mm -hmm. So uh, we checked the internet, checked whether there is such a game, there wasn't. So I, I can say that Casmo Fear is the first sci-fi body cam game. Right. And uh, another thing was, uh, while well, Forge was a walking simulator, we always wanted to make uh, a shooter game or survival horror game, but mm -hmm. back then we weren't ready to do that. We didn't know that much in, in terms of coding and optimization and stuff like that. Right. And now we finally felt, felt like the right moment to do that. So that's how we started with Chasm of Fear. So coming back to the elevator pitch, uh, Chasm of Fear is a sci-fi body cam uh, survival horror game set underwater. And uh, there are like mutating monsters. Uh, I, I will go deeper into that like later on, but there are mutating monsters, there's random events, player choices uh, can affect the entire levels, can affect also the endings and the gameplay style. And also we wanted to give it a try and, and make it multiplayer. So it's going to be a co-op. Yeah. So uh, maybe it, it'll be good to answer here because I get a lot of questions from people why uh 
Casual Fear is not designed for more players because we said that the multiplayer will be two players, basically, two player co op. Um, one thing to, to clarify is that multiplayer is like when you do the, the code in multiplayer, you, you can do it for as many people as you like. But we felt that for horror, the more people are there, it's less scary. So that's why I wanted to do it to make it like only right. two players. And that's right. it. Because like, um, there will be moments in the game, uh, in the full game, not in the demo, where players will have, both of them will have to make a choice. And sometimes the game might surprise you, like uh, lock a door between you two and you have to go on your separate ways. Maybe you'll meet like later that. on in the game, but we want to have these moments because suddenly you felt the safety of being with a friend and now you're like, like all alone mm -hmm. and you have to find your way back so uh in that way we we'll probably ramp up the horror in in the game okay yeah that i like i feel like that's the dream experience like hey you've got because in my opinion i don't really like there's like phasmophobia and like there's those games which no disrespect that's just not my thing like where it's mm -hmm. like the full multiplayer like where there's a bunch i feel like i would lose the essence of horror if i'm playing with that many friends which just like you said but when yeah. I like I saw like the specifically co-op when I was looking at the game Steam page, I was like, that's pretty cool. And then I was I was watching your Q and A where you were talking about what you just said where it cuts off the players, like that's yeah. like the dream experience in a lot of ways. And do you? I guess one question I had about that would be like, so the single player there are still multiple endings like with choices mm -hmm. and whatnot. Yeah. But with like the, like the co-op, is it the same fundamental like story, like how it works? It's just maybe different play areas. I don't really know how that. Uh, no, actually, it'll be the same areas. Everything will be the same. The only difference is like in the multiplayer, we have like a how do I say an invisible guy, uh, like a manager in the game who checks everything, whether the game is single player or multiplayer. So okay. there will be like choices. If you play single player, you pick that choice, and it like locks. A couple of doors it opens another and that leads to different set of areas but in multiplayer sometimes you have to both of you make a choice so that'll be different gotcha. uh, and yeah so the areas will be basically the same and uh, the ending in, in the end like when you get to, to the very ending of the game the game will check everything you've done before and based on that it'll give you the ending and uh you, in the demo, you've seen there were like three buttons, and you press one button, it leads to one set of areas, and yeah. if you press the middle button, you go to other set of areas. However, uh, in the full game, there'll be like more, how do I say it, more ethical based uh, choices. For example, I'm going to give you an example. It might be a spoiler, but. Like a not, moral not... decision? Yeah, like a moral decision. For example, you have a guy who asks you like, to save him. But, and that's like uh, the hardest uh, choice and you have to like go through a lot of obstacles to do that or there will be an easy choice where you just let him die. So those mm. choices will affect uh, the the ending. So yeah, that, that's how yeah, cool. we thought about Chasmophere, yeah. I like that. I, li I, like, I like the way those kind of systems work. I definitely went for the machine gun up the vent. So I <laughs> yeah. mean, that's 100% my way. Um, and one thing I did want to mention with the demo, and maybe this was me being silly. I'm not meaning this as like a, hey, come on my podcast, let me say mm -hmm. something. Um, the ammo crates, are they, mm -hmm. per per gun, are they all the same ammo crate? Uh, so actually we thought a lot about it. Uh, we were considering whether we should have like separate ammo for every weapon. However, the ammo crates in Casmophere, in the end, we decided to be like for every weapon. So you just gotcha. pick up the ammo crate. So in the beginning, like when when the Chasmophere demo released, uh, it was basically you need to have the weapon in your hand in order to like refill it. That's however, what, okay. we, yeah. However, we did an update based on player feedback, and uh, now uh, when you pick up the ammo box, it basically checks uh, if your first uh, weapon, you have, the one you have equipped, is full. It'll add the ammo to the second weapon you have. Gotcha. So basically, basically, it'll like distribute the ammo to all your weapons. So that's okay. how we did it. Maybe it will change in the future because I don't know if you've noticed, but we did like three updates to the demo so far. We are listening a lot to the player community. That's the same thing we did with Mirrorforge. So uh, we did a lot of changes, a lot of updates. So the last update basically was a total overhaul of the demo. So, we, so, so there was like a lot of things changed, a lot of updates, the models, animations, everything. So yeah, b uh, basically what players will, will tell us and the feedback we'll get is how we'll improve the game 
Actually, we'll have an update maybe next week for the demo, which is also a big one regarding optimization. We added ADS uh, while aiming, like ADS sensitivity. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, a lot of things were added. So probably cool. there will be a huge update next Very week. Very cool. Now, I, I guess that's a good transition there. So Steam Next Fest, how was it? You know, was it? A, well, is this your first participating Steam Next Fest or did you do it with Mirror Forge as well? Um, actually, we did it with Alan Sharp too. So this oh, is like yeah. our sixth or seventh <laughs> to Steam okay. Next Fest. So you're you're, yeah. you're a veteran then. You're set. Okay. Uh, well, Steam Next is, is always pretty good. However, the last one, the one that we had now, was probably the best of all the Steam Next Fest we had. I'm not really sure whether it's like uh, the algorithm of Steam or maybe the the game genre itself. As you know, like uh, if you check on, on Steam DB or, or or all other analysis sites. You see that shooter games like perform the best they have the largest player base but i think we've shared on twitter there were like five thousand wish lists during steam next fest so it was a pretty huge number that's, that's awesome yeah, yeah. so it, it was very good the only thing uh that probably was a setback during steam next fest was somewhere like near the end of steam next fest or maybe in the middle i'm not really sure uh i don't know for what reason but steam decided to do the sale it was like a, china china's new year sale or something like that okay and that heavily affected like uh, all of the demos and all of the indie games participating there mm. so probably maybe that that was on steam side they should have done it maybe a, maybe later or, yeah, or earlier it, but sure. yeah it was uh, like uh out of our hands gotcha um how is you know with the with the next fest in mind or even just with people that follow your games as it is Mm -hmm. criticism or you know constructive criticism even it doesn't really yeah. matter it mm -hmm. do you have a is it easy for you to accept like hey this isn't what people like or this needs to change is that is that an easy enough thing or is it like effort's been put into this like i i, I kind of liked it as it is you know whatever the changes may be uh is it is it hard enough to accept or like even be like hey uh, this is how we like it you know what i mean yeah uh, yeah, I mean, I guess it depends, honestly. Like, uh, as I said, like, since we're working full time, we have to know that that what people like is what like what keeps us going. Like, right. Uh, every, uh, we're doing it full time. Like, all of our taxes and mortgage and family and everything, everything's financed by our games. So, uh, but 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 it's very hard to how do I say it? Like, you you need to know the the uh, to distinguish hate speech and uh, constructive criticism. So, like, when it comes to constructive criticism, I'm going to uh, tell you a very interesting thing that happened. Like, there were some people who said, like, I hate the body cam. I don't like it at all. Other people said, this is pretty cool. So, mm -hmm. you can't... So, one, one thing we did there, there was add uh, an option to turn it off. Uh, so, you can turn off the body cam in the options. Another interesting thing that also happened was, like, um, which is this one, we couldn't do anything, honestly. It was, like... Some people said, uh, I don't know what to do in the first area. I don't know where to go. You need to add more things, like more, like basically hold our hand, right? All right. However, uh, and from our experience with Mirrorforge, uh, if you remember the demo, there was a laptop and you, you watch the video on the laptop and you find out the, the pin code for the pin pad. And based on our experience with Mirrorforge, uh, we knew that some people, for example, maybe streamers, uh, won't uh, pay attention to the video. And that's why we added like an objective to appear on the yes. screen after the video. And we got a comment like, you made me feel stupid. You showed me on the screen and it was the video. Like, you can't please everyone. You got to right? be to the lowest common denominator. And like, also, yeah. let's say I'm playing a game and then like the house next to me blows up. I look away for a minute. And I'm just like, ah, okay, it's not my house. I look, go back to the game. Now I don't know the code anymore. So, yeah. yeah, you need to be able to, like, check it. I think that's important. Plus, it's very stylized yeah. as it goes across the screen, the text, like the little yeah. like, like sound effect. It's very good, very good. Yes, so, so we needed to do a ba balance between those things, and you can't please everyone, but we're doing our best, like, to please the majority of players who play survival horror games and action games. However, you can't do every little thing there. Um, but in terms of... I'm going to talk here but also about hate speech, probably. Yeah, sure. Uh, I was a musician for 14 years. I was a singer, and I was also a guitar player, and I was constantly on the stage. And one thing I realized is 
you need to learn how to build walls and ignore some stuff. So just simply ignore it. Right. And that, that career back then helped me a lot with game development because when you're full time, you either have another guy to check those things for you. You're checking them yourself, and sometimes um, it can be demotiv- demotivating, right? Mm-hmm. So, but. But if you learn, like, just to ignore them and don't pay attention to it, just keep on working, you have people that love your game, it's not that hard. However, um, in terms of hate speech, probably uh, the most, of, most of the people who, who do it are, like, uh, I don't know, like, those are the loudest on the internet. We already right. know that. Like, yes. on social media... Uh, like a person who loves the game will say, "Oh, cool game! Yeah, I, I yeah. love it. I'm gonna play it." A person who doesn't love it will keep on. Like, They'll keep ranting. commenting every time. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah that's uh, something I've never experienced. I mean, I'm on a very like tiny corner of the internet, so I'm <laughs> I don't have to worry about anything. I'm not putting anything out there that like, you know, like I'm not playing putting something out there for people to play or anything like that. So that's always been something that I'm like, man, I don't know if I could take criticism truly. I'm like. I'm over here, like, I, I make game reviews. I, I give criticism, if anything. So it's like, yeah, couldn't, yeah. couldn't turn the corner on that one. I'd be, I'd be rough. But, um, no, that's uh, interesting about the, you know, being a musician. Do you do the, do you compose the soundtrack or, like, do the music as well? Uh, no, not really. Uh, actually, for, for this soundtrack, I did, like, a combination of different free sounds that I found. But... Okay. The, I, I don't have t- uh, time anymore like to do music i, gotcha. I left music like three years ago so i'm not uh, singing or performing anywhere okay so I, i'm focused on a completely different uh profession now so right yeah. right okay that i mean that makes sense i mean pr- kind of a headspace thing you gotta lock in i get that yeah what um when making casual fear so far what would you say has been like the biggest challenge assuming it's not something we've answered already uh, probably the the hardest one was optimization and um i don't know if, you, if you've seen the first trailer the very first trailer that we released for chasmophere it was a long time ago uh that trailer looks so different than the game looks now okay uh the thing was we tried utilizing every best feature of Unreal Engine 5, like uh, all the high quality stuff, like Lumen and Nanite, latest technology, cutting edge, I don't know, like uh, uh, to look graphically very realistic. But uh, we found out that lower end PCs won't be able to play it. And we thought a lot about it. And I was like, what good is making a game if a lot of people can't play it? And we had to like sacrifice a lot of things. So, for example, uh, Unreal Engine 5 has uh, global illumination, global lighting, very realistic, very good. And we had to turn it off because it was uh, causing massive FPS drops. Uh, okay. There was also very high quality shadows, which like if, if you if it turn it on, which is one click uh, in Unreal Engine, uh, if I turn it on, it will drop like 40 FPS. And okay. we... We wanted like to, for more players to play it, and I said like we're gonna sacrifice all of this. We don't need the game to look that realistic. Well, we can just turn it off as long as it's fun. So yeah, I think ultimately the uh, the like the saving grace of that mindset, like it even like still looks very well under the guise of like the body cam style, because yeah. it's like you know when there's not like oh that that shadow over there isn't you know you know 4k yeah. this or that or the other i don't really know how it works but uh you know you'd just be like oh well it's the camera you know what i mean it's fine so but yeah. it, well, the game what? i like the the lighting of the game specifically with the colors and everything from what i've seen so far of course thank you yeah well i, I was kind of like uh it made me think a lot like i was watching the unrecord playthrough you know it was very realistic and everything yeah. and i was like i don't know like if these guys managed to pull it off for even lower end PCs to play that, that'll yeah. be that'll be like a miracle. But like we did a lot of uh reading the documentation of Unreal, a lot of stuff, and mm-hmm. there are a lot of things in Unreal which heavily impact performance. And like if someone has like a lower end PC, and I I mean I I can't say it's lower end because like uh, I saw a lot of streamers who have very good PCs, they they had like FPS drops. Yeah. So yeah, we're still very early with uh not a lot of people have good PCs uh, like in the world to support right. other like in full. So yeah, 
Yeah, I think the only time I ever noticed an FPS drop, it was never due to, you know, effects on the screen like the the gunshots or anything like that, or enemies on the screen or anything like that. I, the only time I ever noticed it is if I was going into a new area. Every once yeah. in a while, it dropped down for a bit, but that's kind of the uh, the trade off of having the seamless like level. You know, no no loading screens. I mean, it's one of those things that even still, it wasn't. I never had major yeah, issues well, with it. Actually, yeah, actually, we did a lot of optimization now for the next update next next week. I'm not really sure if it's gonna completely remove the stutter between areas, but mm -hmm. it'll definitely improve it because we did a lot of changes regarding that, like reduce some texture sizes. Uh, optimize collisions to make them more simple, so probably it'll be uh, easier on the PC with the update. Probably it's going to be around Wednesday or Thursday, because in, on Thursday we have a completely new trailer to release for the game. Ooh. So, yeah, Ooh. so, yeah, uh, probably it'll be better, but like I said, uh, Unreal Engine 5 is completely new, and there are a lot of things that you can't find on the internet. Like, right. uh, specifically for the transition between levels, it's called level streaming, there, there wasn't a lot of info on the internet or in the documentation. I even asked, like, a, in Discord groups, asking a lot of developers who already work with R Engine Five, and none of none of them knew like how to do that. Yeah, how to make how to optimize it, and it's it's still early. So probably maybe in a few years, or I don't know, maybe in a few months, it'll be better. Like when we have more data, more examples on YouTube to to take a look at. That makes uh. I... When I was looking at specifically CD Projekt Red, which I know that's left field, uh, yeah. they recently announced that, or last year, they announced that they are going from their in-house Red engine into Unreal. They did like a partnership or whatever, which I thought that was like an interesting thing because they went from making an engine that they can't look up anything on the internet for. They can't look up the answers to this or that or the other because it's just their thing yeah to now having that potential wide at you know there's indie devs everywhere probably wanting to use unreal engine probably yeah. don't want to use unity anymore that's for sure and <laughs> uh you know i just that library as you said you know even discord servers or anything like that just finding those answers i mean it's it sucks if you have to figure out something on your own i'm sure but yeah uh that's interesting i mean I don't make games. I've never made games. Played games pretty heavily the last 10, 15 years of my life. And, you know, I I, I try to find the fun in games. But, like, making yeah. games, it's a no for me. It's a no for me. <laughs> you, you, you say optimization. I'm like, I don't even know where to begin with that. Yeah, there are a lot of things regarding optimization. Like, too many. And yeah. It's in code, it's in the 3D models, in the textures, in the sounds, in everything, basically. So, yeah, optimization can be, like, it can take a pretty long time to do. So mm -hmm. it's very important, like, to pay attention to it, like, from the very beginning. Like, when you're starting the project, you know where you're going. And, right. you know, like, for example, I don't know, uh, you have a mouse, a PC mouse there. You, you can put it, like, 256 texture size instead of, like, 2K. You need right. the, that big texture for a mouse. So, or may, maybe like there, uh, there are a lot of games that do this. Like uh, some, I can say, unimportant uh, objects in your world. Like I don't know, you have a pencil, you have uh, like some small box. They don't need to cast shadows, so they're like gotcha. shadowless in a way. Yeah. Okay. Well, I'm, it's stuff like that that like you know, as a player of games, you don't really think about too deeply. You just think. Well, according to Twitter, you think that if you comment on some developer's account to optimize their game, it just happens. So, <laughs> I mean, it is what it is. But one last thing I want to talk about, or I guess two last things I want to talk about, specifically with Chasmophere. Um, mm -hmm. Are you going to be, like, looking out for a publisher? Are you self-publishing the game? Uh I guess I can talk about this. I mean, so, no, if it's something that, listen, you can say, hey, no, totally fine. Uh, I won't even. Yeah, no care. worries. So maybe I can say it. Um, at the moment, we are in discussion with six publishers. Okay. So six publishers at the moment, we're talking with them. It's just like we're trying to find the best one that best uh, suits the game. And 
those who understand and appreciate the genre and everything. So it's kind of hard like to, to when a publisher reaches out to you, you need to go in, in much depth and research everything they've done and see how they work and see their community before you make a decision. And then right. comes the agreement and you need to go like with a, with a lawyer and check the agreement if everything fits like uh, with your idea and everything. So yeah, uh, I mean, we are open about it, but I'm going to be honest for Cosmophere, Cosmophere is performing in terms of numbers, maybe four times better than Mirrorforge uh, before we got the Red XP as a publisher, but uh, it's performing four times better. It's going really good. So I'm not really worried whether we'll get a publisher or not, because I think I shared it publicly. We already surpassed 10,000 wish lists, and the game is planned to be released on quarter four, and the marketing is going good so far. I think, yeah. yeah. So I guess it depends on what the publisher brings on the table and how much it can bring for, for Casmophere. Gotcha. As a like side tangent, this isn't something I necessarily plan to, but basing off of that, uh, to you as an indie dev or an indie team, what does... What does a publisher, how do you benefit from a publisher as opposed to not? Like, you know, what are, what are your trade-offs there? You don't have to speak specifically about your experiences or, you yeah. know, what your deals were. Obviously, you probably can't even. So with that being said, just kind of as a general, like, why did you before? Was it, you know, exposure? And then, like, obviously, yeah. you talked about your numbers are doing great now, so you don't necessarily need to or yeah. potentially. So it's probably this will be helpful for a lot of indie devs, but uh, regarding publishers, like for example, uh, first you get funding. So funding, fun, uh, you won't have to worry about money while working on the game full time. That's the first thing. Then if you get a good deal in terms of percentage, like how many percent you get after the game releases and how many the publisher, mm -hmm. that's also very good. And the publisher will do everything like in their power to recoup the, the price they've given you and also continue like, promoting the game because, I mean, we know that the world revolves around money. So right. like the more thing they do, the more money they get. So that's the other thing. Also, uh, publishers have uh, a lot of connections with people. So right. like... They knew journalists, they knew the new portals, the people that can bring you on front pages. Uh, they can also uh, provide you funding for going to, I don't know, GDC or maybe going to Gamescom or PAX. So you won't have to pay a, a dime because they will do everything for you. So that, that's another good thing. Um, regarding the marketing part, they have, like I said, they have large communities and they can invest like, I don't know, Twenty thousand dollars for an ad for ads on YouTube or yeah. Know, Google, yeah. That that that's also very helpful because one thing I realized is that um, not a lot of indie devs succeed, not because they're bad in game development, mostly because people don't know about, about their game. Yeah, marketing. like a lot of people. Yeah. So uh, and there's also confusion because, like I mentioned, I was a marketer previously. Mm -hmm. There's a huge confusion in terms. Of they think that marketing equals sales. But the thing is, like when you look at a company, you see you see a marketeer and you see a salesman. So uh, those are two different things. Marketing is uh, the overall process for for the game. Like for example, let me let me take Cosmophere for example. Before we started, we did a deep research, explored everything. What are the trends? What do people like? Uh, whether it's worth it to, to start doing it? So there, there are a lot of things you need to to see, maybe find competitors. In, in terms of competitors, I mean like games that are very similar to you and what you can do to be different than those other games. Mm -hmm. So you need to write everything down, have a good document and see whether that will fit into the market. So that's also marketing. It's not it's not only like shouting on social media and everything. Everything uh, mm -hmm. in terms of branding and all this stuff, everything belongs to the marketing part. Gotcha. So, and then you got like a social media, you got following the trends on TikTok, on Instagram. Like uh, at the moment, memes perform very good. So mm -hmm. if, if you manage to make your game memeable, it'll perform really well and the algorithms will push it. Then one thing I realized is no matter what you do nowadays, it, ads perform the best. If you have the money, and I'm going to say it here because probably you have indie devs in your audience. Um, Ads don't have to be like thousands of dollars. Just start with $50 or $10. Just give it a try. Mm -hmm. You'll notice that even like a $30 ad 
it performs far better than like an organic reach, right? Okay. So you can do it. Just keep on doing it. Just keep on pushing ads with the budget that you have, right? Now, one thing before you get too much further from mm -hmm. this that I want to ask: where, like, where do you implement these ads? Like, uh, you, you mentioned YouTube ads under like publishers and stuff, yeah. but like for smaller yeah. scale ads, I just I'm just unfamiliar, so. Yeah, uh, I guess it depends on your game. For example, like if you're making a cozy game, it performs really good on TikTok and on Instagram. But if you're making like action game, uh, Instagram is not that good. Uh, however, Twitter is really good. You can do Twitter ads, you can do YouTube ads, you can do Google ads. So yeah, those work. And one thing I've noticed in terms of conversion, nowadays TikTok is exploding. TikTok okay. is like your number one. Yeah. 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 So those uh, those posts are those the ones like say on Twitter they show up as like they've got the ad in the top right corner or like promoted tweet right? Yeah. Yeah. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah, that makes. I'm just trying to bridge the gap. Make sure I understand we're on the same yeah. page then. Yeah. So that way, like more people will find out about your game. So like I said, right. the main problem is a lot of people don't know that the game exists. And like I've talked with a friend of mine who's also an indie dev, and he said like. Um, I don't know, but I think people don't like my game. But the thing is, like, there are like seven billion people in the world, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. There's there's bound to be a group of people that like your game. They just don't know about your game, right? Right. Yeah, I mean, there's so much. I talked to actually last week. This is my fourth episode of this, and I did the first two last year, and I didn't do any. And then I talked uh -huh. to uh, Graham. Uh, Uleski last week for, mm -hmm. or maybe it was the week before now, uh, he built games in Dreams on the PS4, and mm -hmm. then he was jumping over to Unreal Engine for his first game, like, on PC, and then potentially maybe other consoles later on. And yeah. that was his, like, number one, like, talking point as far as Dreams. Like, with Dreams, there's a built-in audience. Mm -hmm. And you, like, you know, you put something out on Dreams that's, you know, more than a five-minute demo, and people want to play it. Because they're like they're yeah. getting their money's worth on buying dreams, and yeah. apparently there's sirens going off outside now, so that's cool. <laughs> and uh, okay, maybe it's actually cra crazier than I thought. Never mind. And yeah. uh, anyway, as I was saying, sorry, I lost my train of thought there for a second with the uh, cops coming for me, and. That was the number one thing I took away from his conversation was like, I'm just trying to get out early. Like I'm building this surrealist horror game and cosmic horror thing. And he's yeah. like, I need to get out early about it. And I was like, I was like, yeah, that makes perfect sense to me. Cause you're working off of an audience, but an audience that may not be able to follow you to the PC. Yeah. As it is. So I'm like, that's, and like, you know, you with marketing, I think that's also an interesting trait to carry along. You talk about, exploring what games are coming out in the genre of a similar space and yeah is that another thing you looked at like when picking like potentially like the q4 launch window or um yeah for the launch window uh actually i have a goal in my life like every year or maybe year and a half i will release a game no matter what okay. so i won't i won't sleep i won't do anything else but i, I need to work on the game and finish it in a year and a half yeah so uh, that's my goal. And one, another thing regarding the, the release date, we said Q4. We have a specific date, but I'm not going to say it because right. we, probably it's going to change. But yeah, we did the research. We checked whether there's any sale, any AAA games releasing, any any popular indie games releasing. We need to find like a place where nothing's happening so we can release it then so that more people see it. And uh, in terms of the the research and the marketing, uh, I don't know if you know, but like Casual Fear was uh, the, the Steam store page was released like I don't know a long time ago, and we are re releasing the game like probably in November, December, Q4, right? Okay. So yeah, we did our best to release the Steam store page and the first trailer as earlier as possible because those wish lists need to like go up before you do anything else. And we have a lot of uh, festivals like Steam Next Fest. Then we have what was it called, China Joy Fest or something like that in July. Then okay. we have now FPS Fest in April. 
so we're participating on Steam too. That's also organized by Steam. Yeah. Uh, there's Scream Fest in October, I, th I think. So yeah, there are a lot of festivals, and we are trying to to participate everywhere to increase the wishlist numbers. Yeah. And on, on social media, like uh, we've been doing it ever since the beginning, like posting constantly. Uh, at the moment, we're posting three posts a day, uh, and they're scheduled like for two months. <laughs> That's pretty good. Yeah. I mean, it's cool stuff there. How do you, um, one thing I want to talk about with the Steam page, mm -hmm. the, what do they call it, the Steam capsule? Yeah. I always talk to devs about that. Like, that is basically, you, like, you click on a game, you click on an account, it's got your main image, maybe a trailer, you know, the description, maybe some GIFs in there, all of your links and everything, basically everything you need to know from that page, right? That's the concept. Yeah. And... Yeah. How much effort, or not effort, I mean, obviously, probably great effort, but how much time, like, did that, t like, does that take a good bit of time to really properly formulate, like, what's eye-catching? Like, you know, you had the GIF looking on the Steam page. I remember seeing the one where it shows the two-player, another visual <laughs> thing that's not, I mean, maybe it is in the trailer, actually, now that I mention it, but, like, you know, you're trying to show everything about the game that you can to kind of get it out there, as you said, what different people may like. And where's, yeah. like, what have you found is, like, the most important things to really hit on? Like, are there font differences? And then, like, all of these different small things that you may not think of, if, if that's, if you get what I'm trying to get at. Yeah, well, um, regarding the Steam capsule, the trailers and everything, um, I have a friend who's a graphic designer. And we talked a lot, a lot about that, like uh, not not just now, but uh, even like in the past years or so. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there are a lot of rules and psychological things that you need to know in order to make a good uh, image or trailer. For example, um, you will notice our latest trailer that they're releasing now on Thursday. Uh, it's like minute and fifty seconds long, but there are a lot of uh, if you like look at the shots, they are like very fast and. They, they change a lot and the main reason there is because nowadays people don't have the attention span or uh, or like before so we need to pay attention to that one like why TikTok why Instagram reels are very popular because like people no longer watch long form videos that much as before so right. we need to pay attention to that one secondly this will also probably help game developers the Steam capsule if you see now the Steam capsule is red we have Casual Fear we have the monster one thing I found out is that most of the successful horror indie games have a monster on the right side. So that's what we did. Huh. We have the monster on the right side. For example, I don't know, check Devour. Check, uh, what was the other game? I can't remember. We did like a lot of research with the yeah, games. Yeah, yeah. Also, the Steam capsules are there. Secondly, let's talk about the, the red color. Red color means it's passion. Much more striking. Yeah. yeah, it's striking, means passion. It means power in psychology. Even when you're doing like web design, that's the thing. Uh, and like when you, or it means danger, right? Mm -hmm. Red color. So if you take a look at it, like it, it'll grasp your attention. That's the second thing we did. And regarding the Steam page or the trailers, the uh, how we started doing them, basically we wrote down every, I'm going to go marking here, unique selling proposition that we have for the game, like the hooks that we have in the game. Okay. So for example, it's a, uh, the monsters mutate. And that means that we have monsters that when they die, they can unpredictably mutate into one of a dozen variations. So that's that's something that's in a way unique. Then we have the body cam perspective, which is trending. We have Unreal Engine written down, which is like a huge uh, trend at the moment. Yeah. Then we have uh, random events. So that means more replayability. And the, the biggest replayability factor is the player choices that completely, like if you see the demo, they change the levels. You have uh, you will have in the full game like different gameplay style. For example, you go one choice, uh, you have to play stealthily, while the other choice is more like Doom in rushing into everything. Gotcha. So, yeah, so those those are the things that that are like hooks to the game. Yeah, and that's how we design the trailer. Like for example, when you watch the trailer, you see like limited ammo. You see the, the player like turning the the, the pistol. You can't. I, I like the look of that, like checking the gun and stuff like that. Because yeah, at first you. I was like, at first I was like. It did throw me off at first. I remember, like, man, this feel this game feels perfect for like the ammo counter right at the end, so you can see it as you're like aiming. But then yeah. I was like, you can check. That's just as good, and even actually more of like a horror thing, less of like a action like Halo where you can see it on the guns yeah. directly. 
So I think ultimately that works tonally a lot better even, so. Thank you. Yeah, so, so those are the things that like uh, we thought a lot about. And regarding the description on Steam, there are a couple of things. You need to like uh, write the text as if you're speaking to an eight years old, right? So everyone to understand. Yeah. So you, you make it very simple, get to the point and tell them what, how your game is unique and what is different than other games. That's the first thing. And the second thing that we paid attention is the SEO, the search engine optimization. Like keywords, what people look on Google, uh, how can we bring our Steam store page on the first page of Google? So those are also things that we've uh, paid attention to. Gotcha. Yeah, I I think that when making a game, I feel like the one of the worst things that could have happened, and it actually happened this year, is like you've talked already about like dodging different games in yeah. the genre and stuff like that the whole pal world and and shrouded thing that happened earlier this year did you yeah did you catch wind of that i mean pal world blew up not out of nowhere i knew what it was yeah. but it, it kind of blew yeah. up really big and then shrouded was like number one or like really high up wish listed game on steam and yeah. it did well i think it sold like over two million copies but pal world did like 18 million and i'm like yeah and that came out like a, a week or a couple weeks prior and i'm just like man how many people got their survival game fix that would have gotten in Shrouded had the, Power World not yeah, came out a week yeah, or two yeah. before and dominated the market? Yes. Uh, well, uh, if you take a look at Power World, there's a lot of factors why the game will be successful. For example, it's a stylized game. And, I mean, I, we can talk like all night about Fortnite, for example. Fortnite is a stylized game. There's shooting, but there's no blood. And there are a lot of people, a huge audience that can play it. That's the first thing. That's the same with Pal World. Second, a lot of people looking for a good Pokemon game. And they got a Pokemon game. Uh, another thing was the unique hook was Pokemons with guns. Right. Which was pretty <laughs> interesting, right? So that was another thing. And if you take a look at it, they have they already have like a large audience. They're not limited by 18 plus or 21 plus or mm -hmm. I don't know, 16 plus. So those are a lot of things. And, and it feels fun. And one thing which probably helps a lot for marketing is the game is memeable. You, yes. like you can take any, I can say, pal, Pokemon, any Pokemon there and make it a meme. So yeah, that helps a lot. I've seen so many pal world labor camps. Like I've, <laughs> yeah. I've still not, I've not played the game, so I don't know, but it's so yeah. funny just seeing like quick little snippets on Twitter be like, yeah, I made my, I made my sweatshop make me guns. It's like, oh gosh. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I've seen that too. Yeah, it's it's very interesting. Like, uh, I've tried Pal World, uh, although I don't have much time to play right now. But yeah. it, it felt kind of interesting. Although, in a way, I don't know. Like, there are a lot. Some of the animations didn't feel that polished. Right. I mean, that's my opinion. But again, knowing what happens in game development and how hard it can be, I'm not judging anything. Like, right. Good job, guys. Good job, what you did with the game. Like, yeah. yeah so, I mean. For sure, I, I like. I think any, and you know, they didn't expect that either to happen yeah. the way it did. So, I mean, it's interesting all the way around. But to kind of round out, I had a, a couple of, you know, more you specific rather than game specific questions that aren't anything too crazy. Um, I wanted to kind of just get to know you as like a dev and a player, which we won't spend too much time with this. Then we'll kind of end out. Yeah. But um. You know, what are, like, you've talked about the games you started on. What are some of your favorite games? Maybe biggest inspirations. You could even tie this into Casmal Fear. I know you've got yeah, a... Honestly, it seems yeah. like most of the games we've talked about have been horror-oriented, so I'm sure there's probably some room there for conversation, but... Honestly, you, you got to be surprised. Uh, yeah, I have favorite horror games, although horror is not my number one favorite genre. Okay. My number one favorite genre would probably be RPG. Although, as you know, like as an indie developer, you can't do RPG. <laughs> that, that's way too much work and yeah. it's too hard. Yeah, but like I was, uh, I've played a lot of games and in terms of Chasmophere, I can say uh, Dead Space, Doom 3. Those were the games that inspired me. Uh, some people say it looks like Bioshock, but I won't agree with that one because Bioshock is more stylized. And this one right. is like, more like Doom 3 set underwater, so it's not Bioshock. Okay. Bioshock has a different color, different tone, and stuff like that. Um, 
They mentioned also System Shock, although I've only watched System Shock. I haven't played it, honestly. And in terms of RPG games, RPG games, uh, basically, I'm going to talk about a period in my life that complete, that, that it, it's completely ruined life for me. I was a player, I was an addict, I might say, for eight <laughs> years playing World of Warcraft. Oh, no. Yeah. I mean, it makes sense. You had those Blizzard roots going, so you're just like, oh, yeah. man. So I played World of Warcraft. I even remember, like back in the day, uh, uh, friends calling me to go out, like in a pub, have a drink and stuff. Yeah. And wouldn't go out. I was like, "You go, I'll stay home." Only to play Skyrim or Morrowind. I think it was Elder Scrolls. So those two games were probably my favorite back then. But nowadays, I, I don't know. I haven't played a lot of games. Honestly, I don't. I even don't have the time. That's the first thing. And the second thing is, uh, I don't know how I say this, but like. When I play games now, it, it it's kind of I even talk about this on Twitter. It's more like you're analyzing everything. You can't feel the joy, right? For yeah. example, uh, I played a multiplayer game with a friend, and he's like going forward shooting, and I'm like uh, looking at the textures and the UI. He's like, "Come, yeah. dude, what, what what the fuck are you doing?" Right? Yeah, Sorry. yeah, yeah. No, you're good. I think I have like three or four times already. You're fine. Yeah. So. So I'm like, like when I start a game, I'm more like playing it from a game dev perspective, which is bad, honestly. It's not good because you can't enjoy the game for what it is, right? Right. That's and, I mean, yeah. that's interesting. I mean, I was gonna that, that was like my follow up question was like, do you think it's important as a developer to experience other work? Maybe not so much to be like, you know, hey, I, I like this. I should do my version of this, but more so of like, how other developers handle certain situations and you know maybe technical achievements or something like that i did i don't know but obviously you've said kind of how you feel about it already so yeah but it's, it's very important to play the games because like uh for example you can't i'm gonna give a like very simple example but like you have a reload weapon right if yeah. you press, press r you get reload weapon but uh you can't like come up with i'm gonna put uh, reload on Y or on U. You need to know like what are the basics of that genre. You need to know what what people uh, are all, already familiar with, right? Right. So in a, in a way, like even what AAA studios do sometimes is like you go with the familiar things that you have in that genre. For example, E is always interact, uh, W A S D is always for movement. Yeah. But then you add a small twist to it, like some unique mechanic unique hook to, to make it a bit different mm -hmm. but you can't escape like from the mechanics right yeah. for example it feels like uh there was a comment like uh even for chasm fear like uh yeah they're copying unrecall which is, i mean it's totally different but yeah for example if you take a look at fps mm -hmm. games does it mean that all of them are copying doom or duke nukem or right. half-life right mm -hmm. so that that's the the, the familiarity in, in the the basics of the game right in the genre yeah, I'm. I've never understood that criticism. Like, unless a game is like, it's so hard to even find an example of something that's so similar. Like, I can't. Like, even Pal World. Like, some. Like, a lot of people talk about how that rips off Pokemon. It's a completely different styled game. Like, outside of maybe like an aesthetic, which is kind of similar, but even still, probably like I don't play Pokemon either. Probably looks better than Pokemon. So, yeah, you know, I well, mean. You know, a lot of people might hate me for this, but when I talked with another developer regarding this and he said the same thing for Palmore, yeah, they're copying Pokemon. And I'm like, just, dude, just take a look at the numbers and, and the sales. Yeah. I, I won't say anything else, right? Yeah, people may, might say anything, but the game is successful. We can't deny it. Yeah. For example, also for Fortnite. Fortnite, I'm not defending it like with the skins and stuff like or, or anything like that, but... The game is successful. You can't deny. Oh, like, I'm a, I'm a Fortnite defender. I I have so yeah. many hours in Fortnite. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Fortnite is uh, that's like my guilty pleasure. Yeah, I've played Fortnite for two years, maybe. Uh, I don't play it anymore, honestly. So it's not that I don't like it. it it's it's kind of just like fell off. I don't know. I mean, I get it. I uh, I kind of go and like. I go in lulls like there's like okay this season's really good or like i really like the way the like the gun like the loot pool is this season I'm like i'll be like yeah this is really good and then the next season it's like all right these guns feel like shit they all feel like shit i guess i'll kind of <laughs> die down a little bit 
but I always end up finding my way back. So I don't know. Uh, well, I remember during that period when I played Fortnite, I also played Apex Legends and Call of Duty Modern Warfare. I think yeah. I played those two, although I haven't played them as much. Actually, no, I've played Apex Legends more than Fortnite gotcha. back then. Yeah, but I mean, nowadays I usually like, to be honest, at the moment when I try to relax, I either play uh, maybe for an hour Star Wars The Old Republic, that's an MMO. Okay. So I play that one just like to relax. Like, I'm, uh, Star Wars is more like, um, it's not a traditional MMO, it's more like a single player, just go do the quest, like right. relax. So I play like for one hour. And you know, like when, when you're working on a game on your full time dev, you always have alarms, <laughs> like I mentioned earlier, like for, for TikTok. Yeah. So I just have an alarm, alarm, I'm going to play for one hour. After that, I'm going to close the game and that's it, right? Gotcha. No matter how interesting it is. So yeah, yeah. I'm always trying to find balance because. Uh, like when you go full time dev, uh, some people might think like, yeah, I had a friend who talked with me and he said like, oh my god, you're doing what you love and everything. But uh, not a lot of people realize that sometimes it takes like eighteen hours a day to work, and you always need to learn. So it's not like everything's uh, I don't know, like the world is pink or something like that. Right. You have a lot of things you need to do, and everything like falls on your shoulders. So yeah. Do you think? Uh... Going back to the game dev talk, I guess, for just a second. Do you mm -hmm. think, like, this is your first game full-time, correct? Uh, no, Mirror Forge was the first Mirror game. Mirror Forge was as well. Okay, sorry. That's right. Yeah. You, this is your first game full-time with your brother. Uh, yeah. With that, like, do you find yourself, like, you, you spend time learning something new? You know, maybe a technical hurdle you had to get over or this or that or the other. Maybe a new way you like, you know, streamlining a process. Do you find yourself thinking... I'm going to use this in every project, like this knowledge in every process, like in every project going forward. Like, do you find yourself like little tiny, like, like leaps yeah. forward? And, you know what I mean? Yeah. Well, absolutely. There are a lot of things that you can reuse in other games with small modifications. And there's also things like regarding optimization. That's it. I mean, that's the optimization. There's not, it's not like inventing something totally new. Right. It's uh, regarding optimization. It's mainly like lo looking at charts, looking how the CPU, GPU do, and like uh, tweaking a lot of things. It's uh, it's time consuming. It's not that hard in terms of learning. But uh, yeah, you can always like for example, uh, let's start with Cardinal Sphere. We did a weapon system where you have weapons. You can switch the weapons. You can reload. We can simply like take that system out. It's already multiplayer ready. We can just add some additional stuff. We don't have to do the core uh, basics and the code. So, yeah, you can reuse a lot of things like from the games. Although, honestly, for Chasmophere, we didn't use like a single line of code from Mirror Forge. It was a very different game. It was basically a different engine. So it was UE4 to versus five. UE5. Gotcha. Yeah, so a lot of things that were different, yeah. However, for, for Chasmophere and for future games, we can reuse a lot of things that we did in Chasmophere. Okay. Well, very cool. I mean... I, this has been a very engaging conversation for me because you've talked about optimization, marketing, stuff that I didn't even necessarily plan to, you know, talk about per se. But I think it's a, uh, it's very interesting how many things go into game dev in such a way that I don't think about it. Like these aren't even things that pop, like I played the demo, I really enjoyed the game. I think a while ago I wanted to mention this earlier when we were talking about Mirror Forge. Was there like a demo for Mirror? When would have a demo for Mirror Forge have been a thing? Would that have ever uh, been a thing? Yeah, there were two demos actually for Mirror Forge. I can't honestly remember when they were, but there was one demo like I think it was last year January or something like. I can't honestly remember. It was a very long time ago. There was one demo which was on the first Team Next Fest, and then uh, I got acquired by DreadXP, and we did a different demo for Gamescom and PAX. Okay. So it was a completely different demo based on players' feedback. So, gotcha. yeah, there were two demos. Yeah. Okay. Maybe I played it. I feel like I might have. I, I haven't played the game in full, but I feel like I might yeah. have played a demo before I knew I would ever be talking yeah. to you guys. But, um, well, you know, here's an interesting thing. I, I don't know if you know, but like, I think I've talked a lot, of, even on Twitter, but uh, the games you play at this particular moment, 
uh, can affect what you do at this moment. For example, I was really in love with layers of fear and visage and outlast back when I was doing Mirror Forge. Yeah. And that's why I did a game similar genre. And now I play Dead Space and uh, what was the other? And Doom. And so yeah. I was like, I'm going to make a game like this. Of, of course, I'm going to check the market and everything. But right. like, the passion for it was from the games I played. And uh, also, why it's underwater. Um, I was on vacation this uh, last uh, year, and I decided to go in Egypt for the first time. And I don't know if you remember, but last year in Egypt, there was like a shark that attacked a man there. I yeah. can't say I have. Yeah, so basically I was in the water, and honestly, my greatest fear is sharks. Like, I've never seen a shark in real life, but I was, uh, because maybe because when I was very young, I watched Jaws, and I was terrified. Like, yeah. when I go into water, even if it's a lake, I mean, yeah. it's crazy, but even if I go in a lake, I, like, I look underwater if there's anything, like, like any shadow. Lake shark. So, yeah, so <laughs> when I was in Egypt, we were, I remember we were in the sea and people started running around. It was like 50 kilometers from our place. And people started shouting, like, get out of the water. So, and when I came up with the thought of making Casma I was like, I'm going to make it underwater because I'm terrified of sharks. I'm going to put a yeah. huge shark there. So that's how it happened. Have you played, um, have you played Soma from Frictional yeah. Games? Do you like Soma? Absolutely. It's an amazing game. It's, it has a very good story. Yes, I, I enjoy that one a lot. Um, yeah. The Bunker is also pretty good from last year. Yeah. Um, but, okay, well, on that note, I have one final question for you, and I'll, I'll be cognizant of your time. We can kind of you know wrap up a few minutes after the episode or whatever. Do you like Alien, like the movie franchise? Are you an Alien fan? Actually, yes, and I watched the first Alien, I don't know, for maybe for the 10th time yesterday. Wow, okay. All right, so we're, yeah. we're hitting on the heels here then. Did you see the new trailer? Uh, for, for the game? For, no, for uh, Alien Romulus, the new movie that's coming out this year. Oh, actually, no, I haven't. Actually, I should take a look at it. It's, it's looking pretty good. It's, that's why it's on my mind right now. I'm just, I'm very excited. As for Alien games, I have like... That's like my favorite franchise, I have to say. So like I have to like I'm I'm a mail carrier. I, I deliver mail. So I spend five or six hours driving around with nothing to do but delivering mail. So I sit mm -hmm. here and I think about different games that could be made within the alien franchise. And I like I have like four concepts. I'm like, man, if I ever got the nerve to make a game, I would do this just without the alien or without the xenomorph. And then just say, like, yeah, just pretend it is. So I don't get, you know, sued. Yeah. Alien is, is very good. I mean, the movies are, most of them are good. I, I can't say all. Oh, I didn't mm. like the last. But yeah. yeah, the first ones are definitely something different. Um, regarding the last movie, is it really Scott again or someone else? Uh, he's that? producing, but the director is, the last thing I know he did was the Evil Dead reboot, like the 2013 mm -hmm. movie. Which yeah. yeah, I don't know. I think that was well received. Everybody, the trailer looks really good, and like I'm just like okay. Yeah, I saw Alien Covenant. It wasn't really my thing. Yeah. And... What, what What do you think about Prometheus? I think it's over explaining. Yeah, that's well, my that's my oh. opinion. I like yeah. how detached it is. Like it's ultimately like if it if you look at it as a prequel, it's so far as a prequel that it's like you don't see the direct lineage you can look at it as its own thing mm -hmm. but i think as far as like explaining the xenomorph as a weapon or whatever you want to say i just yeah it's too much for me i'm like okay let's calm down <laughs> here yeah uh, I, I mean i don't know i kind of liked it uh I'm, i was also a huge star trek fan and star wars both star trek and star wars so i can't like do any i don't know like which franchise i like more but I love like when something is explained to me. So it felt kind of good with with uh, Prometheus, especially I love the the moment like how Earth was made and how civilization came to be. It was very cool, interesting concept. I mean, there was definitely a lot of cool stuff with it. I just, especially I think with Covenant, I think Covenant, in my opinion, is where it kind of 
towed the line because that like bridged the gap even further i mean it even took on the alien name by that point yeah so like it's it acts as kind of like a sequel to prometheus while it also bridges the gap between the alien franchise and i'm just like i don't know i mean (laughs) it's it's something for me but the new trailer looks good i recommend it and to anyone watching this video go check out i'll have your twitter handle and you know the game steam page linked below in the video and all that stuff Thank you, Thank you for joining me for this. This has been a very insightful conversation for me. You're great to talk to. I appreciate it. And consider checking out the game. The demo is available now. Is there? Is it ever getting taken down for any points, or is it going to stay up until launch? Uh, probably, if it ever gets taken down, it will be for a new demo. But for now, gotcha. it will just stay. Because we, we are planning, maybe, not really sure, but we are planning a new demo with the multiplayer features. So probably people later on will be able to play multiplayer even with the demo. But I can't say anything because I'm not a programmer. I don't know how hard it is to do multiplayer. So gotcha. I'll just leave that until like we get the release for the demo. All right. Okay, well, thank you for coming and thank you for watching. And I'll go ahead and end that now.